Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny. Welcome to Amulet Podcast. Today, I have a super special guest. I have been gushing a few minutes before about how excited I am to have you here, Mitchell Kaplan from Books and Books. And if you are a Miamian or you travel here often, you're very well aware of Books and Books. And you, sir, are the creator of this amazing bookstore and so many other things. So thank you for being here today. Jenny, it's my absolute pleasure to be with you. And, you know, it's really exciting about all the things that you're doing. I, I think that, um, you know, Miami's literary history and literary tradition needs, um, needs a great future. And I see it in you and what you're doing. Thank you so much. Oh, you have no idea what that means to me. Thank you, especially no. coming from you. You mentioned you opened your first bookstore at 25. Usually at 25, people are thinking about parties and, you know, where to go out at night. Well, what, did... happened, what happened to me is that I, it's kind of a matter of survival, really, because I went, I was an English major in college. And like most English majors in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life when I got out. I and can I probably relate. should have. Yeah, I probably should have taken a few years off, but I, I didn't. And instead, I went right to law school. And that's what a lot of English majors of my age went, did. You know, we went to law school immediately afterwards. And I, you know, even though I was familiar with the law, and I went to a very good law school that was, was kind of a public interest law school. So I was, I was going to save the world and that sort of thing. I right. even going there, I knew that the law was not something for me. So the question was, what was for me? And I knew that literary culture was something that I really, I, I really admired. I really loved the idea of being involved with books or literary culture and writers were my heroes. This was a long time ago. This was before the internet, before computers. This was when, if you wanted to listen to a song, or, or, or read a story, you had to do it in, a, in an analog way. Right. And I love that whole world. So, and bookstores meant something to me. You know, I went, even when I was in college in DC, Washington DC, there were some fantastic bookstores. And, and I said, you know, this is what I'm gonna do. So I was young and I was teaching. I came back to Miami and I started teaching so that I could earn a living. And I found a little space in Coral Gables across the street from where we are now. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, if I can earn as much, if I can pay myself as a bookseller as much as I'm earning as a teacher, I'll stop teaching. And fortunately or unfortunately, I was earning so little as a teacher that it wasn't very right. hard. It wasn't a hard bar to get over. Yeah. <laughs> so after the first year, I stopped teaching and just work, you know, just develop my bookstore. And fortunately, I opened at a really good time when, you know, when bookstores were, there were thousands of bookstores happening all over the country, little bookstores like mine. And over 50% of all books sold were sold in physical bookstores that were indie bookstores like mine. And so it was kind of a golden age that I opened in and I didn't even realize it. And, and you know something, I moved back to Miami and being here only a couple of years, I met all the, all the, all my friends now are people I met through the bookstore. Um, and so it was, a, I basically constructed a world that I wanted to live in. Right. And that's what I wanted to do. That's amazing. I guess, it, amazing. I guess it's by the way of saying it was my way of, of, um, it's my way of partying. <laughs> yeah definitely sounds like the ultimate you know to be able to go out and pursue your dream especially at such a young age it's it's amazing that you had the the wisdom to to see that you needed to do that for yourself because I feel like when people dive into a career you're kind of just thrust in there and it's hard to let go yeah, well, that's, you know, as, as I say, it was kind of a matter of survival for me, because right. I knew that if I had finished law school, 
that would be very hard for me not to practice law. Yeah. And I just didn't want to grow up as an unhappy lawyer. You know, I mean, right. you know, I was very fortunate. My dad was a lawyer and he loved it. He loved being a lawyer. And I knew that I didn't. And so I, if I couldn't have his sense of passion, uh, it was not something I wanted to pursue. And in retrospect, I realized that I pursued a passion that I have. And uh, the passion that I have was for books and having a bookstore. And if um, there's something that I've come, come to know is the passion economy, which is a world of people who open bookstores, restaurants, record stores, other things because they're passionate about it. And, right. and, and that's kind of what I did. That's amazing. And you mentioned there were so many other bookstores at the time, but they're, they've dwindled extensively. So on Books and Books is still thriving, thankfully, and providing such a service to the community. To what do you credit its success? It's being different. Well, I think part of it has to do with, you know, the incredible passionate booksellers we have and the staff that we have. We have an amazing staff. There are people who really, you know, love books, who sacrifice to be able to be around books. And at the same time, I think, you know, we have a community that understands the value of a small independent store of any sort. And they understand that small business is really the backbone of a community. And if you want to distinguish yourself as a town, you have to have distinctive businesses. And a bookstore can be one of those. And, and you know, I firmly believe in the bookstore as third place, community center, all of yes. that sort of thing. And that's kind of what we've tried to do is be a third place. And you've achieved that tremendously because really walking into books and books it's it's walking into an experience it's not just a bookstore where you grab a book there's just so much going on and the people like you mentioned the staff everyone's just so happy to be there and so helpful and just willing to talk about books without a care in the world it's amazing well thanks jenny jenny what do you like to read what is it that you read Ooh, you uh everything and anything that i can get my hands on but if I had to, to pick like a, a genre per se, I love anything that's a little bit dark, like a dark thriller or anything that just goes a little bit out there. That would definitely be. What, a what good have you place. read recently that you've liked along those lines? Along those lines? Um, well, I reread recently Flowers in the Attic. Do you remember that book? Yeah, V.C. Andrews, right? Yeah, I reread hers. Um, and uh, you're going to laugh, but I reread The Exorcist as well. You do like dark <laughs> stuff. I do, yeah. Do you, read, do you read Anne Rice? Did you like Interview yes. with the Vampire? Yes, yeah. I was actually thinking about her the other day and wondering if she had anything new coming up but i couldn't find anything well she wrote a whole series on on christianity actually um, really yeah a whole new series that and i don't know what's coming out new but you know there's a lot of good dark stuff out there now um there's um a wonderful um there's a wonderful uh writer who um you might like. She's written, it's older stuff, but her name is Tanana Reeve Du. She's a Miami writer. Oh. Although she lives in LA. She's from Miami originally. She wrote, uh, she writes these really terrific kind of horror, um, these historical horror novels that are really quite good. I'm kind of like Jordan Peele, you know, in the in like Jordan Peele stuff in film. Yeah. She, she even teaches a course at USC in uh, or UCLA in black horror, which is kind of interesting. That would that sounds like a class I would definitely take. Yeah, that's very interesting. So now that you mentioned reading books, what was the last book you read? Uh, the last book I read 
was an amazing book by a woman named Sarah Broom called The Yellow House. I had read it when it first came out, but I just had to have a conversation with her and um, for an event and it was amazing. It was, uh, it's, a, it's a memoir about growing up in New Orleans uh, in, on the sort of wrong side of the tracks in a yellow house. She was one of 12 children. Oh, wow. And she was the youngest. So it's a history of her family, which is also a history of New Orleans and an area of New Orleans called East New Orleans. Um, and then it's what happened during Hurricane Katrina and, and racial inequity. And it's a whole, it's kind of a mini, it's a microcosm of what's happened in our country as well. And Sarah Broom's Yellow House is kind of amazing. And then I read a book that's not out yet. It's called Bewilderment. It's by Richard Powers. And Richard Powers, um, he's kind of amazing. He wrote a book called The Overstory, which is kind of about trees. And this is a wonderful kind of retelling of the novel Flowers for Algernon, if you ever had to read oh, that. Oh, yes. And it's kind of a retelling of that given our contemporary world right now with climate change and you know what's happening um, with technology and dislocation from ourselves. It's, it's quite good. It's coming out in September and you're going to hear a lot about it. Nice. Hope I'll be definitely be on the lookout for that. Yeah. So what happens in the book business is I write, I read a lot of stuff that's not quite out yet. Mm -hmm. Things that are, um, they call them galleys. Um, I'll show you one actually. That This is one that I'm in the middle of that I really love. This will be out in October. It's by Amor Tolls and Ooh. it's called The Lincoln Highway. He wrote a wonderful book called A Gentleman in Moscow. Yes, I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, which is a huge, huge bestseller. And this, this one is really, really excellent. It's called The Lincoln Highway. So this is a galley. This is the way they come to us sometimes. They're paperbacks. Okay. And the book will be a hardcover. And on the back, it tells us, you know, it tells the bookseller exactly what the media is going to be on it, when it comes out, is the author going to be touring, you know, all of those things. That's so interesting. So you, you get like a for real behind the scenes before everything happens. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like what happens in the book trade because, you know, we're buying a few seasons ahead. Right. So we know what's coming out. That's amazing. Um, now that you mentioned about, you know, finding all these interesting books, you are also responsible for the book fair, which I'm sure a lot of people are aware, but yeah. it's, well, it's not just me, you know, right, you're partly take, responsible. Yeah. I would love to take credit for it all. But <laughs> the but person, I, I've always, person I've always seen as a mentor is Eduardo Padron from Miami mm -hmm. Dade College who's a president of that college for a long, 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 long time. And Eduardo really, uh, you know, brought a bunch of young booksellers together and said, let's do a book fair. And uh, I had had some experience with it. I had just started Books and Books a few years beforehand. And, you know, we then just put on a book fair downtown when nobody thought anything like that could happen in Miami. So we're right. now in our 38th book fair. And I, it's become such a part, ingrained part of the city. Everyone looks forward to it. And, and I know people that schedule their vacations around the book fair just so they oh, can really? be in That's town. Cool to hear. Yeah. What yeah. do you remember? Do you remember any, seeing anything really great there? Oh my goodness. I can't pick out like a specific um, event, but I just remember going every you know, every year, just my parents making it a day and just oh, wandering cool. around and, uh, you know, being told I could only purchase two books because otherwise, I would, you know, there would be trouble. And just trying to figure out with the, that little paper that you guys. Um, right. The Fairgoers Guide. 
Yeah, trying to figure out, okay, which are like my two top options. So I have lots of great family memories around the book fair. That is great. That's yeah. Great. Well, your parents obviously help foster a love of books in you. So that's a great. Yeah, yeah they, they, they really did. Um, books have always been a huge part in our, in our home. And I think it, it was easier when I was growing up because like you mentioned, the internet was pretty much non-existent and we didn't have all these distractions but do you have any advice for parents uh, nowadays that have to compete with screens and they're trying to foster a love for books in their children well the, the great advice is just kids do things by example so make right. sure you read around your kids and also yeah. read to them there's some wonderful books that and it's it's a very special time that you can have with your children is when you read to them and mm -hmm. also read with them. In other words, read and have them be reading themselves, you know, yes. while you're reading and just have that time. Um, I think it's hard to limit to, it's probably hard to ban screens from your house, <laughs> nor should you, but if you can teach children how to incorporate the love of books and the love of story into their lives. That is a great gift you're giving them. Right. I, I think that's a, a huge key point because it's not just, you know, here, sit and read. Uh, a lot of kids are just like, okay, whatever, you know, I'll read for 10 minutes and then move on with my life. But like you said, if they, if we can really teach them to understand everything that goes into becoming part of the story, uh, it, it might take on a much more permanent place in their life. And I'd also suggest that you let them read whatever they want to read. Yes, <laughs> you know, that's such a so good many, point. It didn't happen with me, but so many people I talked to started out reading comics and other things and horror and science fiction and let them, you know, the, the, you know books should not be medicine. Books should be right. pleasure. And let them read whatever it is they want to. Yeah, that's such a good point. Now, I have two little girls uh, so How old far, are they? How old uh, are they? 10 and 5. Wow. Yeah. Um, so far, they love books. So I feel extremely lucky that I don't have to sell them, you know, on the idea of right. reading. But the older one, she really loves um, Dave Pilkey's comic books. I know. Which are They're so great. fun. They're He's so got a fun. new one coming out soon. She she's made me aware. She, yeah, <laughs> yeah she, she loves him. And for a while, I was like, you know, you're, you're getting to the double digits. You're about to be 10. Should we really, shouldn't we move on? And now that you mentioned, just, you're right. She's reading. So let's just let her enjoy. Let her enjoy that. It'll, it'll, yeah. she'll, she will move on. She'll move on to other stuff. Do you yeah. know that we had Dave Pilkey at the book fair one year? And it was many years ago, and I didn't realize a lot about him. For instance, he's married to a Japanese woman, and they live in Japan for part of the year. And what oh, he I didn't said, know that. and what he said, which blew me away actually, is that there is this cave near this island where they live. And when he starts a book, he paddles out to the cave, goes into the cave, and starts writing in the cave. When, when he writes, it was really quite a, quite a moment. Um, he's a very soulful guy. You wouldn't know it by the books he writes, but he's a very, very nice guy. Um, and it's great to be able to see how he turns on so many kids. To books. Yes. It's, it's miraculous what he does with those, those books. He really gets them into it. I'm so excited. It's, it's amazing. Um, we're, we're lucky that she found him because <laughs> he really made the re the love for reading so much easier. Um, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, we briefly touched on, you know, Miami not having the best reputation, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper into that. So uh, you mentioned, you know, Miami's not really a, a, a big place for, that's known for 
reading and literature and things like that, we have this idea that we're this big party town, but there's so much going on here. We have so many talented people. Uh, what do you think about that opinion? The way the world well, sees I us? I think that's the way the opinion started that way. I mean, my people thought of Miami that way for a long, long time because of Miami Vice and all these other things. But, right. but that I think that's that's changing among people who know and are paying attention. People understand that we have some amazing writers who live here, as well yeah. as 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 well as writing programs, the book, the book fair. Um, you know, we bring into the bookstore close to 300 writers a year, and the book fair brings another 500 in per year. So there's a lot of, you know, writers that come through Miami. And, you know, if you look at like FIU's writing program, it's got best-selling authors, it's got poets, yeah. it's got all kinds of wonderful people. And then there are writers who live here that you're not even aware of. And then not only, and then how about all the writers who are writing in Spanish, right? That yes. Come from Miami or in Creole, or, you know, we have such a multinational uh and multicultural community so i think that idea of miami being not a serious place i think um a lot of that is going away a lot of that idea you know a lot of that notion uh, that that notion of th of miami being uh very superficial you know thankfully is dying off because of the reality of the fact that miami isn't that way Right. About time. People know, right? <laughs> People know, right. Yes. Um, so since you've been around so many writers, do you have any advice for anybody who's thinking about delving into the world of writing? God, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I really believe that if a book is good, it'll get published and get well published. So my first piece of advice is make sure to write the best book that you can possibly write. Yeah. That, I know it sounds kind of um, simplistic, but a lot of people feel like that if they get a first draft done, you know, the next step is how to get it published. But right. actually what they need to do is identify people who can be good critical readers um, and, and write for yourself first. Don't write for a marketplace necessarily. Write for yourself. That's and, true. And write something, you know, and, and revise and have other people read it and get it to be as good as it can possibly be uh, before you go out with it. Right. What about anybody who's thinking about opening up a bookstore? Any advice for them? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's an old joke. How do you make a million dollars as a bookseller? <laughs> You start with two. <laughs> uh, I, if you want to open a bookstore, there, there are a couple things that I would say. One is you must be passionate about it or else it doesn't make any sense. You can make more money just investing your money, you know, at a simple interest rate. But if you're passionate about it, the world opens up. There's nothing better than having a bookstore in terms of if you love authors and you love all of that other stuff. But it's an extremely challenging business, to say the least. You're competing with so much out there. But, um, but I feel like I've made a great choice. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, we're lucky that you stuck with that choice because look how much oh, thank has you. come thank out of it. You. Um, you also have your own podcast. I do, I do. I have a podcast since... It's a lot of fun for me. You know, it started during when we didn't have a pandemic. And so what I would do is I'd have people come to the store. We'd have lunch and we would just talk. And, um, but now that, now that we're doing it by Zoom and doing it remotely, um, it's a little less intimate, but I'm able to speak to people around the world right. where I'm not just relying on people who are coming to Miami. That's true. And you, it's called The Literary Life with Mitchell yes. Kaplan. And you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. Um, you have some really wonderful episodes on there. I'm, I'm a fan, but I'm oh, wondering, 
what has been one of the most memorable episodes for you? That's a really good question. Uh, well, we've had some really cool episodes. Um, I did one with Dave Barry where I learned a lot about Dave that I didn't know. And then I also did one with these, you know, I love typewriters. And I did one with, um, with a type, one of the last typewriter guys in New York City. And that was very, very cool. Um, I mean, I could go on about a lot of the ones that I've done. You know, we had Min Jin Lee, who wrote Pachinko, was in the store and we did one with her. And then at the book fair, I was able to do one with Jason Reynolds, who's a guy that I really, really like. He's a, a YA author who's really smart, really, really good. Um, but probably the one that I just recently did that was really kind of a wild ride was with Quentin Tarantino, the filmmaker. Yes. You know, <laughs> and... Um, that was very interesting. For anybody that hasn't listened, you're in for a treat. That was very yeah, No, he was really very, he was very honest, very down to earth. He was really cool. It was really uh, great to be with him. And so it's kind of a, you know, kind of a roller coaster. Um, I enjoy it. You know, I've always loved radio. Radio is something I've always loved, even as a kid. So I see podcasting as kind of an extension of radio. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, and you've also gone into film pr producing. I have. How's that? Have. That's been a kick. You know, I just got in the mail. This just came. This is the, um, the DVD of our latest film that was just released. It's called Let Him Go. Yes. With Kevin Costner and Diane Lane which is now, it came out in the movie theaters in November, but it's now on HBO, I believe. But you can now get it on Blu-ray and DVD. And I just got a whole bunch of them sent. So I thought I'd show it to you. This was great. So what our film company is, it's called the Mazer Kaplan, uh, Mazer Kaplan Company. And we make books into film or television now as well. So we did a movie called the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, which is not only a great book, but the film was terrific. It's about a reading group that is on the Isle of Guernsey during the Nazi occupation of Guernsey during World War II. We also did a great Christmas movie called The Man Who Invented Christmas about Charles Dickens and the writing of A Christmas Carol. And then we did one which was really a, a moving uh, account of troubled kids in high school uh, called All the Bright Places with, with Elle Fanning was in that one. And that was based on a book as well. And we have now four or five different TV projects and we have a bunch of different films kind of in the works. So it's all very exciting. Yeah, it must be such an interesting experience to see books go from a shelf to a film and well, be part of that transition. Yeah, no, that's really very smart of you to point that out because it's very much like what I normally do, which is trying to put books in people's hands. Right. So this is just putting a different version of the book. Right, a different someone, medium. Different, yeah, someone's hand. It's about storytelling and, right. you know, all of that. We even work with nonfiction. So I know you had Nicholas Griffin on your show mm -hmm. and we're doing his book, um, The Year of Dangerous Days. We're going to be doing that as a TV That's series. That's going to be so cool. Yeah. But. So there's a whole, it's been a, it's been fun moving in, in that direction. Yeah. That's amazing. That uh, getting back to books is, I'm curious, is there a book that's like your number one, a book that you constantly return to, to kind of reinvigorate? Yeah. That's a really good question. That's a hard question. It's, you know, there isn't really one book, but there's a lot of different books that, I, that I've read that are meaningful to me over the years, but there isn't really one book. Um, there are books that I remember, you know, and usually I remember them nostalgically, you know, mm -hmm. at some point in my life, 
you know, I remember all, I remember getting lost in picture books when I was a kid. I, I then right. remember emerging into this world of, you know, I grew up kind of in the, I was in middle school and elementary school in the 60s. So I, there were all these political books and things about, you know, civil rights and the war and that sort of thing that influenced me when I was growing up. And then there were just some phenomenal kind of book experiences I remember, you know, like books that meant something to me when I was young. And now, now it's hard for me to separate, you know, books that I love from writers that I really like, and they kind of go hand in hand. That's so interesting. Yeah, I was thinking, what would my answer to that question be? And it's, it's really tough to pick one book that you can say, okay, this is, this is that one book that really speaks to me. There's just so many. Although I have to say, I, I do often go back to The Kite Runner. Yeah. That, that book did something to me. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. quite a book. Right. You know, I find, I find when I, when I think of going back to stuff to reflect and all that, I find that poetry does that a lot. You know, yes. I'll often go, I'll often go to some of the poetry books that I have and poets that have meant something to me and go back to them and, and, and sit or just try to discover new poets that, that are around. And, and that's been, that's always very, um, I find that I find a lot of solace in in and reflection in reading those kinds of things. Right. Yeah, it's so interesting because writing is such a solitary activity and so is reading. But it's it's really those two are what connect you, right? In a transcendental way, which is so special. Well, particularly during this last year and a half, right? When, yeah. when the one thing that we've been taught going through COVID is how precious time is. And, you know, when I find myself engaged in the white noise of life, either online or with my phone or listening to the news, I'll often just unplug and say, okay, I have to get back to something more essential. And, you know, and, and reading is something that can center you, you know, so quickly. Um, there's nothing like picking up a book that really engages you. Yeah. There's one that I just read, you know, I've been finding as I get older, I'm, I'm reading more books about that, you know, kind of involve nature in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And there's a book that's just came out that I really loved called Fox and I. Fox and I. It's by a woman named... Catherine Raven and what it it's a memoir and um, she was living in Montana in a small kind of house in you know isolated in the woods in the in, in the wild areas of Montana even though she taught and she was a biologist who never believed that you could you could or you should anthro anth anthropomorphize um, that you shouldn't um, anthropomorphize animals, that right. you shouldn't do that. And one day, uh, a little fox showed up at her house, right? And this fox kept coming to her house every day at exactly 4.15. So she became really engaged with this fox. And And the book is about how that changed her life and changed her way of thinking about nature and animals. And at the same time, you learn a little bit about her backstory. But what was really telling for me was her precise and descriptive uh, um, uh, pictures that she painted of the natural world that she was living among. And it was phenomenal. You know, so here you are living, you know, being in Miami, which has a very different um, uh, kind of environment than Montana and you're reading right. about that natural world and it just transports you in a way that uh, other things don't. 
Right. That's, that's so interesting. It's, I'm definitely, I wrote, I'm going to put that on my to be read list. It kind of, the way you described it, it kind of like reminds me of like Walden. It's very much focus like this on. Yeah. 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 It has that same thing. There are a lot of writers who've written like that. People like Barry Lopez, who's written like that, as well as um, Gretel Ehrlich and some really wonderful nature writers. Um, here in Florida, we have Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, right? Who wrote right. Everglades River of Grass. And she kind of does the same thing or Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings uh, when she writes about Northern Florida. So there's great traditions of that here as well. So I just have a couple more questions for you. I sure, know sure, sure. We'll, we'll keep it uh, short and, and to the point. Um, going back to your life as a teacher, uh, do you think that had a profound effect on on you as a person, even though you were in the classroom for, you know? Oh, it did. It did. I loved, I loved being a teacher, even if it was just for three years. Right. And what it did is it really, on a practical level, when you stand, as you know, as a teacher, when you stand up there in front of over 200 kids a day, it kind of makes you bulletproof. You know, That's in true. terms of going out and speaking publicly anywhere, because if you can stand up in front of 200 kids, high school teenagers, kids, nonetheless, <laughs> teenagers, boy, I remember a time when I was explicating a poem, you know, it was, it was in their, in their textbook. And it was a, I forget which poem it was, but I was, I knew this was a, this was a class of not necessarily college bound kids, but there were kids that were in 11th grade and you know, I wanted to give them a sense of poetry. So I was reading a poem and I realized at the point that I was reading it, that if I was going to get them interested, I had to be overly interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I really got into it and really kind of dramatically read this poem. And I heard a kid in the back go, wow, he's really into it, <laughs> which was really kind of cool because, you know, it, that they recognized that was something that I thought was kind of important. But at the same time, I made some amazing relationships with some of my students. That writer I told you about, Tanana Reeve Du, she was mm -hmm. a student of mine. Uh, and uh, and Tanana wow. Reeve, Tanana Reeve, you know, she wasn't that much younger than me, but we've maintained a relationship all these years. And it was such a kick to be able to present her at the store at one point with her. I can't book. imagine what that must have felt like, right? Felt really good. And I'm still in touch with some of my students. A number of them teach in college. One of them brings down, one of them teaches Cuban studies at a, or Latin American studies at a Midwestern college. And he goes to Cuba and brings kids with him to Cuba on a study thing. And he always stops by the store first. So that's kind of good. And yeah, no, it had a profound effect on me. I, I realized a lot about teaching and how difficult it is and how teachers are often you know a punching bag for you know a political yeah. punching bag and teachers are expected to do so much when society does so little and um i can't tell you uh you know just how much i value that profession and what teachers do they are they are the backbone of so much of uh, our society. I, I have to agree with that. Yeah, it's uh, definitely undervalued and underappreciated. And it's a shame because like you said, the teachers are like the first frontier into Don't you get society. really annoyed? I, don't you get really annoyed when you, you find this thing where teachers have to go out and spend their own money to get classroom materials and that yeah. sort of thing. It's, yeah. it's just, it's, 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 it's absurd. It's absolutely mm -hmm. absurd yeah. where that I, schools become overcrowded. I mean, I, it's, we know what it takes to have a good education. And until we as a society devote ourselves to doing it, we can't criticize teachers or the school system. It's, you know, they're yeah. doing the best that they can. And we know that, you know, in the Dade, Dade County Public Schools has some amazing schools. 
you know, and we some do. We have some programs. amazing schools and amazing teachers as well. Yeah, and we know, uh, you know, that that can be duplicated throughout the entire school system. And there's some amazing stories. You know, for years I sat on the Silver Knight Committee for English, okay. and the stories that I would see, the kids who would come through, such difficult lives that they led, but at the same time they devoted themselves to not only others, but also to, you know, to English and to reading yes. and to what they were doing. We're turning out some amazing kids from the school system. Yeah, I have to agree. It's, you really see uh, for as cliche as it may be, the, the triumph of the human spirit in these kids, they, they just, they have this tenacity and they push through the craziest times and debilitating times right even a full-grown adult wouldn't be able to handle what some of these kids go through and and they just push through and become better it's amazing yeah no it's it really is it's it's kind of amazing what we ask of people sometimes um and and you know kind of the um We just, I think, have to be better as a as a country, as a people. As we have to, we have to really make sure that we treat each other with kindness, and yes. you know that that we are, you know, that we're better to each other, and that we're that we care about one another. We're only as good as the weakest among us, I think. Right. We have to make everyone as strong as they can be. Absolutely, and I the easiest way would be through education. Oh. And books that's why I say and, if you create yeah. if you create a lifelong reader, I think yeah. that's all they need really. A lifelong reader is by definition a curious person. Right. And if you're curious, you know, you become you become a learner as well. Yeah. And and you're able to not just look outside but inwards as well, which really sounds like it's proven to be the key of getting better. Yeah, yeah. You must still be in touch with some of your students, I bet, right? Uh, yeah, I, I am. And it's it's quite a treat to be able to see them flourish into these amazing people. So yeah. it's, it's really interesting. And you, you must have been an amazing teacher. They were oh, so thank fortunate you. to have you. I don't know. I mean, I was quite young when I started. So I feel like I learned along with them. Um, and maybe that was not good, but I tried. At least I can say. So you were an English I teacher, tried. right? Yes, yes. And I was a debate coach. So I did Oh, you were? Too. Wow. Yeah, it, that was really fun. That was so really fun. So did you fun. ever come across, did you ever come across J.C. Moya from LaSalle? He was a LaSalle debate coach. That and last name sounds familiar. He so, went to Miami High. J.C. started out as a bookseller at Books and Books. Really? And then he went on to become, he's a teacher there at LaSalle now. But he also has taken his debate team very far as well, which is great. That, yeah, the the debate programs here in South Florida are really, really interesting. They're, yeah, they no, provide they a lot for these kids. So I was super fortunate to be a part of it. It was, I have very nice memories of just going all over the nation and having these kids argue, you know, these super crazy topics, important topics, and them just being so passionate and getting prepared. It was cool. great. Well, Thanks. thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You and too, Jenny. we loved having you. Me, I loved having you. <laughs> <laughs> it was great having you, being with you. Nice to meet you. Bye bye. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you.